Hello, my name is Kevin Yanikowski, and this episode is on social movements and transition. So you want to make a social movement, huh? But what kind? There is proactive, reactive, alternative, redemptive, reformative, revolutionary. It's like a tyranny of choice. With all these choices, as soon as you choose, you'll be regretting it later, thinking maybe sitting down during the national anthem wasn't the most professional way to make a social movement. Well, anyways, let's get to it. There's a lot out there. So first, proactive social movements are probably what you had in mind. They want to promote change, thus they're proactive. Whereas social movements trying to resist change, usually with all the old fogies, are reactive social movements, reacting to people trying to change values. The movements that we often think of as radical are split into both revolutionary and redemptive social movements. Revolutionary movements will involve change affecting us all, such as policy reform, whereas redemptive social movements involve changing people, like what people believe. For instance, those people who go door to door or meet you in the parking lot to foist their beliefs on you. So the radical movements involve both revolutionary and redemptive social movements, depending on whether you're trying to hit the masses or hit individuals. On the other hand, there are more minor movements with limited change called alternative and reformative social movements. Alternative movements affect individuals like in redemptive movements, but on small things like habits. For instance, a public campaign to stop slow drivers from driving in the left lane. Ugh, annoying. Whereas reformative social movements affect the majority of people in a minor way. Again, maybe through policy change. Think reformative is looking for a limited reform. Revolutionary is looking for a radical change. There are way too many movements to choose from. So I've decided. Instead, let's all make a millenarian movement like that of the UFO cult for Marion Keech in the Cognitive Defensive episodes, who said that the world was going to end because aliens were coming to destroy the planet. Sounds like a really fun movement to make. So how do we get this movement going? Well, first, aside from the millenarian movements, if you want to go and do that, be my guest. I'll make sure not to join you for your end-of-the-world prophecy, as fun as, it, as fun as it really seemed like it was going to be. Movements are often based on feelings of relative deprivation. That is, one feels entitled to something that they don't have. Aside from relative deprivation, there are some other ingredients we need to add to the pot from resource mobilization theory. Basically, the resource mobilization theory says that movements are not just an irrational event. They depend on other resources such as money, ability to mobilize people, the time it has, etc. Our movement will then have to take these things into account as well. Now, the mobilization of your movement idea Let's say it's about the world going to end due to Bigfoot coming out of hiding. It's going to have to spread, right? Well, how exactly does it do that? The theory that seeks to understand this is diffusions of innovations idea. Diffusions of innovations theory argues that innovations use channels which transport their information over a certain time. Basically, diffusions of innovations theory is saying that communications of your innovation is going to happen among specific channels, like your intended audience, so via lunatics, over a certain time. Well, how often do those lunatics communicate? Well, I wouldn't know. But it's important to note that low-yield models called infection models can help us understand how the dissemination of ideas occurs. The first infection model is the core model, where there is a main group that mainly speaks with each other, but occasionally speaks with the outer members, or in this case, infecting the outer members. The inverse core model would then be the opposite. Outside members who know the group would then infect the group, thus infection from multiple outside members. The bridge model is where one person who connects two groups is infected from one group and brings it to the next. And lastly, there is the spanning tree, which involves the interconnection between people with branches out from these interconnections. Like a phone line running down a street with many houses attached. Same thing. Apparently, after a study of sexual relationships in a high school of over 800, the spanning tree was how sex relationships, and thus possibly STDs, were spread compared to the other infection models. Pretty interesting. And that is the end of this episode.